I had dreams, but it's not that I could say, okay, for sure, in 10 years out, I'm going to be where I am now. Richard Vogel is a rising force in international show jumping, known for his calm, precise writing and down-to-earth persona. Trained by Ludger Bierbaum and now business partners with fellow German writer David Will, Richard's partnership with the big strided Bay Stallion United Touch S has been stirring up major buzz throughout the horse world. Their wins over the last two seasons include the Rolex Grand Prix at CHI de Geneva, the Lugano Diamond Five Star Grand Prix in Wellington, and the Canna Cup at the Spruce Meadows Masters. Richie also emerged as the most successful rider in recent Aachen history this summer with four wins and a total of 10 podium finishes. The more you work, the luckier you get, is Richie's philosophy, and he emphasizes the importance of perseverance, dedication, and a strong work ethic in achieving one's goals, both in sports and in life. Richie, welcome to the Dear Horse World podcast. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Congratulations on the Nations Cup win at Spruce Meadows. Thanks. Team Germany kind of dominated. Yeah. Well, it was close, but uh, my my teammates uh, did a brilliant job and uh, and uh, yeah, won it. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about that because mm -hmm. Germany at the moment, just after Paris, like completely dominated across all three disciplines. I'd love to hear a little bit about your perspective of like how Germany is so dominant across the Olympic disciplines and also specifically in show jumping. Um, yeah, I think um, mainly uh, you have to say Germany has a big history in uh, equestrian in general. Um, uh, back in the days, almost uh, all the farms had horses, different types of horses than we have now for our sport. But uh, that made the people already attached to the horses and how we, horses always were kind of part of the family um, in, in a lot of families uh, many, many generations uh, ago already. So I think um, this makes uh, Germans um, in general good good horse people and, and you know, it's not just that they um, grow into horses, most of the families anyways, not... Uh, on the first or second generation, like uh, most of the times there's a big history. Maybe not in show jumping or in dressage, but uh, just generally speaking, having horses around. Um, and then the, the breeding part obviously is very big in Germany. Uh, there's a lot of horse breeders and uh, the horse breeders have daughters or uh, their their kids have kids that ride and, and in, in that kind of um, way, I think um, a lot of different people are involved into horses and um, all the horses that get bred uh, in Germany also needs to need to get um, developed and, and you know, um, first when they are three years old, typically around that age, you, you break them and then you continue maybe four years old, you do already one or two. Uh, small shows to to get them going a little bit in an easy way and then five six years old they can do a little bit more and then maybe seven eight years old already see some international fei shows uh, and then okay when they're nine probably around nine and ten they're actually adults and then if they're if they have the potential they can start to do the bigger stuff um but therefore i think we have riders that that are able to do kind of everything we have riders that uh, are known for being very good in breaking the horses, like put the first time saddle on, uh, sit the first time on them, and then uh, con continue their their um, way and and their career. And um, for each step, uh, I think there's brilliant riders and brilliant stables in in Germany. And luckily, we also have quite a lot of, I would say, um, riders in the top um, that. That can jump uh, the biggest classes in the world and same in dressage and and cross cross country so um yeah i think um actually it's not that germany just has naturally a lot of good riders but i think therefore that we have a uh, huge breeding in our country almost the horses make us being good riders like i think almost the horses teach us being good riders mm. well and when you're in germany like 
you know, if you guys win the Nations Cup or you win the Olympics, like it, it makes front page of the national newspapers. Mm -hmm. And then you talk about how German like horsemanship and horses are in generations and generations of 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 families. Yeah. So I feel like it kind of almost creates this like beautiful ingredients yeah. for a more horse culture country, you yeah. know, whereas in other nations or other countries around the world, if you win a nation's cup, like at Spruce Meadows, yeah. or if you win an Olympic, it won't, won't necessarily make the front page. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder how that feels. Like, yeah. do you feel as an athlete in Germany, as a rider, you, do you feel really recognized? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, latest, I would say after this Olympics, um, where we very much helped, uh, the medal score of Germany, uh, without the equestrian sport, uh, there would be, there would be four, four or five less medals. Uh, so, um, so I think, um, that really proved that German equestrian is a, is a big part in general in the, in the German sport. Uh, I must say, um, the, the latest de development, uh, probably was more that, you know, in the countryside, there is less farming, the farms that are there get bigger mm -hmm. and more professional. It's, 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 um, not that there's 10 farms or farmers, it's more that, uh, nine stop and, and one keeps growing and keeps, uh, going bigger. And, um, therefore it's, it's. Also, the question spot gets more professional. There's not so many amateurs anymore. I mean, there's still a lot of amateurs, but not in a way that, you know, the grandpa has a farm there anyways. And on the farm, there's two, three horses and he breeds with two of the mares. And then, you know, there's always horses been there. Um, those situations, um, sadly are more, um, on the way out. Uh, people move more, I think that's all, all over the world, people, but also in Germany, people move more towards cities yeah. and there obviously it's hard to, to keep horses. Um, so, so more and more people are actually, uh, all the way in hundred percent into horses or not attached to horses at all. So, um, so I think 50 years ago in Germany, there was more people attached, uh, with horses than now. Um, but the ones that are attached, I think for them, it's almost a bit, I always uh, say it's almost like a truck. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's a bit addicting. And, uh, once you start with horses, you never really get away of it. Uh, in my experience anyways. It's true. It's true. Yeah. So you did something interesting. You quit school to mm -hmm. ride professionally, despite the fact that your family and everyone said, don't don't do that it's true yeah it's not something i would be proud of but uh yeah that's what it is what advice would you give a rider who's listening to this podcast who maybe wants to make a big sacrifice like that or make a big move and and everyone around them is saying you know you don't you don't do that well not to quit school <laughs> <laughs> i think that's not a smart advice to give mm. um what i what i can say um i always had a dream to to make my hobby my passion uh to make a living out of it um to to do it as a professional um i at that age i didn't really know in what way i would do it um you know, I, I, I did my apprenticeship and then I started for, for Lutke Baerbaum working as a home rider. So it's not that I always, I mean, I had dreams, but it's not that I could say, okay, for sure. in 10 years out, I'm going to be where I am now. Um, but, uh, if someone, um, has that passion and is very convinced about it, I think, um, at least it always worked out for me very well to do it a hundred percent or not at all, you know, not, not do things halfway. Um, but that could also mean finish school with, in my case, there would have been one more year of school, which probably in the long run would have not changed so much, but, uh, you could also finish school and then, uh, do, do writing or whatever is your passion a hundred percent. Um, but yeah, I, I think, um, if you if you're very passionate and um and you you love what you do then uh, you should do it 100% and if you if you feel like after 1 2 3 5 years 
okay, um, it was a nice journey until here, but it's going to be hard for me to, to do this all my life, or I actually prefer to do something else for my living and have horses as a hobby by side. Um, then you can still structure your life a little bit different uh, since you're only young at that age. But uh, I find, um, yeah, if, if that's in your head, you should, you should take a risk and, and go for it. Uh, otherwise, uh, at least in, in my position, I always thought if I'm not uh, taking this shot now, uh, in five, six, ten years, I would always think like, what if I would have tried to be a professional, you know? If I would would have done something different for my living, then I would have always dreamed about it, and I would have never knew would you yeah would you be happier as a rider now or yeah I I would survive too doing something else um, for a living, but uh, I'm I'm very happy I I was choosing that path. Do you think big risk often meets big reward? I think so. I think uh, at least uh, if, if typically speak, speaking, uh, people don't take risks, there is no big rewards for sure. Um, I think uh, um, I, I have a bit the mindset to, to rather take a chance and, um, and lose something than to, to be scared of losing, going into it already. And, and um, yeah, if you, if you give it a try, you have the opportunity to get something good out of it or to to win a class or whatever you, in whatever situation you're in but if you're if you're not even trying to win a class or or to succeed in something then you lost already so um so rather try try and and don't succeed but learn out of it than uh, not even try hmm. you were how old when you started writing for liquor i was 19 Oh wow! Yeah, I and I stopped school with seventeen. Yeah, started my first job uh, with family Herbert, um, who who became kind of my second family. I was very lucky all my life to be surrounded uh, with great people mm. that uh, gave me great uh, opportunities and and always a hand, you know. Mm. And um, and then I was yeah uh, there for two years and then figured I want to see something else and um, and. And learned something, something more, and uh, I started to work for Lutger then with nineteen. Yeah, Lutger is obviously a legend. Yeah, yeah. And he's a big personality. He yeah. has a lot of. He's very specific and particular about he run how he runs his programs, how he does his, how he works with his horses. What are sort of what would be three things that you learned in your time riding for him? Being patient with the horses, um, like um especially with the young horses or if you get a new horse or um, yeah, you have a new horse and you want to grow together, get the relationship better. Um, you cannot rush it. Uh, it takes time. Sometimes uh, it goes quick and it only takes a month or two. And sometimes it takes half a year or a year uh, or with, with uh, developing the young horses, often the good horses um, are the very special ones. Um, but, but they're, yeah, they're not easy to handle or they have a special character too, you know, that uh, makes them find, fight in the ring. But outside the ring, it might be not the easiest path with them and with some others, it'll go much quicker, but with them a little bit slower. But um, yeah, you, you cannot rush it and you shouldn't rush it. Otherwise, you just fall back a few steps. Um, that was something very important I learned there. Um, and then nothing... Nothing comes around without um, putting enough effort in it. Um, so so um, something I learned there is really that hard work pays off. Um, what else would I have learned? Uh, not, it's still not uh, perfect, but I learned to be a bit better on time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I was always late and uh, it got a bit better. Yeah? Are <laughs> yeah. they very on schedule there? Um, like for example, my, my colleague, uh, Philip Weishaupt, who, who I was stabled with, uh, he also is not really much on time, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, ideal wise you, you would have to be on time. Yeah. You left Ludgers to go mm. out and now you work with your 
fellow countryman David Well, yeah, who I love. David's such yeah. a nice guy. Yeah. Um, and many people told you not to leave Ludgers also. Yeah. And yeah. Had a lot of people telling you, but yet you still did that, and you went yeah. against the grain. Yeah, exactly. I it was a bit the same situation than uh, stopping school. Mm. Um, also, not something that you should typically recommend. But I always, um, I always was not just uh, interested in riding horses, but also in the business business side of it. Mm -hmm. So um, with Ludger, I was uh, just a rider, if you want to call it that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't so much included in the business, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I just, I just um, always had the thought in my mind to, you know. Uh, have your own stables and be a bit more focused on the business side of things. And um, yeah, at Ludgers, I think I, I had a great job and I learned a lot of uh, good things and and um, how to manage horses and everything around that. Uh, I had a good relationship and, and kind of had the, the backup uh, uh, on the day that I left. Ludger said, you know, if, if it doesn't work out or if anything ever goes wrong in your life, you can always come back. So that was a nice thing to to know and to have in back of your mind, mm. um, and yeah, then I I started my own business and and thought I I now was the time to give it a shot because I was still young enough and there was always to be uh, there was always a way back to to be an employee rather it's for Ludger or for someone else you know. Coming back a little bit to your horsemanship. I'd love to talk about that because now you're doing a lot of young horse development. Mm -hmm. And we were just talking before about young horse championships in Germany. Yeah. Um, so what's your golden rule for developing young horses in the sport? Golden rule? Um, not sure if there's a golden rule. I think uh, it's actually uh, many, many things need to play together. It's a, a complicated puzzle. Mm. And then more... Um, the puzzle is complete, uh, then better uh, you're at developing young horses. Um, as I said, uh, you for sure need to be patient with them. You need them, need to give them the time they need. Um, we're young and we're motivated. Uh, we always tend to, you know, be a bit rushing and, and you know, want to get one step ahead every day. But sometimes it just doesn't go a step ahead and, and, and you need to stay on the same level for a few months or half a year or even a year mm -hmm. and, and um, wait until the horse is ready for the next step. And um, I think that's, that's actually the most important part about it, to always listen to your horse and feel into your horse, uh, especially with a young one uh, that you want to build up and bring up. Um, when is it ready to do the next step? And... Um, they have no voice uh, or no no language, but yes, they they can talk to us and they they give us those signs. Uh, we just have to to listen to them, you know. And um, yeah, I I wouldn't say I always do it perfectly. Uh, mm. Probably no one does. Um, also not me. But um, then then better you do that. I think uh, then then better you you're at building up and bringing up young horses. So what are some of those signs that you look for when a horse is feeling confident and like ready to move up a level? Like um, it depends uh, on, on the stage the horse is at. Um, if you have like a four years old that does the first show, mm -hmm. um, obviously he needs to jump around uh, a course very well at home. Uh, if you are already at home, have trouble to to get around and uh, let's say there is a Liverpool underneath a vertical or somewhere and he spooks at the Liverpool and is not a huge fan of it. Uh, in my opinion, it makes no sense to drive to the show and expect a different situation at the show. Uh, it mm -hmm. just makes the horse going to the show. Everything is even more exciting for the horse. Uh, everything is new. There's other horses around. Most of the times there's plenty of horses in the warm up that um makes the horse feel in a different situation uh, than at home where everything is more quiet um and then the horse most of the time doesn't get more self-confident at least not in the first shows 
and um, might stop again at the water or at the stupid, uh, uh, stupid at uh, a uh, spooky mm. fence, mm. and um, you get into a stupid situation, and um, I think that's just not a good experience for a horse, you know. Um, on the other hand, if if at home everything goes well and you feel well prepared. Uh, there's still enough surprises if you go to your first show or to one of the first shows for the horse, but uh, at least you should feel very confident and you should feel very prepared and the horse should at home give you a feeling that uh, it does um, jump around that small track uh, very easy and uh, and knows uh, what's what's to do, you know. Mm. Um, then if we talk about a six or seven years old, um, Let's say if a meter thirty um, feels like a lot of work, mm. um, then you should rather skip the one thirty five final or something, because um, then the final is a bit bigger again. This might be more technical. Um, so then I think a you you cannot expect a good result, and b if you have a horse with a lot of quality that is careful and and a bit more on the shy than on a brave side. Mm. Again, it it might uh, come out of the ring and and lost more confidence than it gained, and um, and it threw you a few steps back, you know. Mm. So I think um, those would be examples where you where you first have to make sure that what you're doing right now with the horse and on whatever le level you're right now um, competing with the horse, mm. you should be feeling very confident and everything uh, has to run smooth uh, and then. You can you can think about the next step, but but don't uh, try to rush it too much and and do one or two steps forward before the horse is even ready to. Mm. Confidence. You talk about confidence. Mm -hmm. Horses is being confident to go to a to a show or to, yeah. to to step up. How do you build confidence in young horses specifically? I think um, typically speaking, you know. Um, they're such nice animals. Um, in 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 the nature, they 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 have the instinct wherever there's something in their mind or in in, in their eyes a little bit uh, you know um, looking not great, scary. unusual, scary. Um, they run away. Mm. So so then uh, we come into their lives. And we put a saddle on and we sit on them. And <laughs> <laughs> but uh, very quick, and and I do it quite often myself actually. And and it's amazing how how quick they accept it and how quick they realize. Okay, uh, that's the guy that was just on the ground beside me, and mm -hmm. he he actually feeds me. He takes care about me. He's he's my partner. He's not an enemy. He's not something I should be afraid of. Mm. Uh, I mean, it depends on horse from horse to horse. Mm -hmm. Some are fine in two minutes and some it takes uh, a few trials and a couple of days or even weeks until they're relaxed with someone in the saddle, you know. But um, typically speaking, most of them, they they get relaxed pretty quick. And, and I think from there on, they see you as a partner and and as as someone you know that helps them out in in situations and then uh, now if we talk about show jumping at one point you know you ride and you do and at one point you decide okay now it's time to do the first jump mm -hmm. and probably you did loose jumping already with the horse so they kind of know what to do when there's something like a cross whale or whatever yeah. in their way you know yeah so now I think it's on the rider to just not really um, handicap the horse. Like um, mm. almost you rather leave it alone a little bit more than try to be on it too much, you know. Because mm -hmm. uh, when they do loose jumping, if they're a little deep or a little off, they're fine too. Uh, there's just no rider that that is maybe too strong, might be too strong with the hand or with the leg or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so I think especially the first few times, if you if you leave them a bit on their own, it's almost easier. And then, especially if they have a good rider uh, in their early careers already, um, they learn that if you want to shorten the stride up to a fence or if you want to move up to a fence, they actually learn and get trust into the rider mm -hmm. that the rider is helping them to find a better approach to the jump. And um, that's 
later on what we call rideability and and the horses also need to trust to to listen to the rider because they they learn that the rider wants to get them in a good position and not uh, in a bad position you know um so i think from the from the very early stages on um they they quickly trust us and and get confidence into their riders uh, and then next it's, it's actually just our job to to never lose that um mm. to never never try to yeah lose that relationship um because um that, that's the that's the situations we talked earlier before if you step them up too quick or whatever they might feel like what that guy on top wants from me i'm not able to do and then and then the horses start to to doubt uh, the decisions a little bit you know mm -hmm. whereas if a horse that was never asked too much um always thinks yeah wherever the the rider is cantering up to i'm able to jump it because he never asked me too much and whatever is in front of me uh, is is easy work for me mm. so i think that's the ideal uh setup or or development of a horse remember the first time you found that feeling of deep connection with your horse that moment when you knew that this was more than just a sport more than just a hobby it was a partnership it was a way of life but then things got complicated maybe it started with conflicting advice from trainers or your own frustration of not making progress at the pace that you wanted or maybe you even started feeling afraid of your horse's behavior suddenly that magic feeling that deep connection that started to slip away. I've been in your shoes and I know that feeling. That is why I created NF Plus. I want every horse and rider to experience that profound connection that starts with education and a strong support system. At NF Plus, we are breaking down barriers, bringing you the best training, the most helpful advice, and a community that supports you at every step of your journey. With audio and video lessons on everything from horse care to groundwork to rider psychology, NF Plus is your key to unlocking the true potential of your partnership. It's not just about looking good in the saddle or winning ribbons. It's about rediscovering why you fell in love with horses in the first place. It's about becoming a better horse person, becoming someone who has the tools to achieve the goals and find that feel that all horsemen and horsewomen aspire to have. Whether you're an experienced competitor or just starting out, we have designed NF Plus specifically to support you. Join Noel Floyd Plus today and become part of a movement that puts your relationship with your horse at the heart of everything. Because when you ride with understanding and connection, the possibilities are literally endless. Sign up today at noelfloydplus.com. That's noelfloydplus.com. What advice would you give riders who are in a situation where maybe they have lost trust? The horse has lost trust in them. It's very yeah. noticeable. The horse starts yeah. to stop or to run yeah. out. What advice would you give them? There's there's different scenarios, but um, it, it's hard to have one perfect yeah. advice for all of them. Of course. But typically speaking, um, go a couple of steps back. Let's say you jump uh, 140 classes and it's not going so well. Mm -hmm. Don't hesitate to jump 120 classes. Don't think uh, 135 uh, makes it much easier. It's it's only really five centimeters. If the trust is gone, if the horses are not feeling confident, those five centimeters don't do a lot. But if you go in a 120, the world looks totally different. The horse recognizes, okay, this is quite less to jump. And, uh, and if you have a few good rounds in the 120 again, mm. Then it's about, then then it's the right time to step it up again. Mm. But not not don't think um, okay I step it back down to a one twenty. I have one good round and now I can do a one forty again. Mm. Like to that's why we we try to never get to that point where we lose the trust because to build that up takes quite a long time. Um, so so there it's important to to give the horse time, um, give the relationship with the horse a lot of time to to heal again. Mm. and um and go quite a few steps uh, backwards and um i think then then relaxed then more relaxed the rider can be about it um then then also also the horse picks up on that you know yeah. if the rider 
is stressed because it doesn't work out in the 140 class and now you try to do the 135 and it's in theory a step down but the rider is still a bit stressed because it might stop again and mm -hmm. you know uh, the horses realizes this so if the rider also feels more comfortable going in a 120 mm. and is more rex relaxed about jumping a 120 class with that horse um, that also the horse will pick up on it and um, gives the horse already automatically a better feeling mm. about it. So, um, yeah, I think it's 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 important to to realize that and to analyze that and to immediately uh, go a few steps back mm -hmm. and and um, give it enough time. So you talk a bit about trust in the relationship, and mm -hmm. I've heard horsemen speak before about relationship banks and trust banks so mm -hmm. like you make a deposit and you make mm -hmm. a withdrawal right mm -hmm. so there are a lot of things you can do in the saddle to deposit mm -hmm. trust or relationship what do you do you have any things that you do on the ground with your horses for the relationship and for the trust yeah i think it's it's the whole picture it's not just um the riding part it's it's everything around now, in in my situation, um, as I'm a professional, uh, for example, we are now in Spruce Meadows. We jumped the Grand Prix this afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, next week is the next show with the next Grand Prix. Uh, at Tuesday afternoon, we have a stallion presentation at home. Mm -hmm. So I won't be able to spend a lot of time with my horse after the Grand Prix, whether it was good or not good. Mm -hmm. uh, I catch the earliest flight I can get, mm -hmm. fly home. And then it's it's not on me, but it's on Felicia, my groom, mm -hmm. to to be there with and for United. Uh, and she flies home with him, and uh, she spends most of the time with him. Mm -hmm. um, not because I don't want to, or or um, um, or I I don't think it's necessary, mm -hmm. but but because yeah, we're we're always very busy. Because of the demands on you. Exactly. And um, and I know Felicia does it as good, to be honest, probably better than me. Mm. <laughs> um, so so it doesn't necessarily have to be the same person, mm -hmm. but they also need a person on the ground where they rely on and, uh, and they also have uh, this relationship. Uh, and I think this is uh, as important than the riding itself. Mm. Um, no doubt about that. So now you you mentioned Touchy or yeah. United. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about him because everyone's been buzzing about him. He won Geneva. You've won. I mean, you've you guys have been racking up quite yeah. quite a, a roster of wins. What is it about him? I mean, there's a couple of things like from his breeding point of view, which I definitely want to talk about. Yeah. But what is it about him? that is causing so much buzz you think i i think he's just such a personality um if he if he canters into a ring i think uh, the whole crowd sees that he's really something special mm. uh, the way he canters the way he moves the way he jumps the the huge fences i think is something very unique and and so is his personality so um yeah i think he's he's yeah wherever he is uh, people recognize him and uh, and most of them fall in love with him yeah yeah in english i don't know what it is in german but when a horse has presence yeah you know they yeah. come into the ring and everyone's and like you know there's yeah. iconic horses in history yeah. that have like really this amazing yeah. presence yeah and humans seem to really respond to that yeah when you talk about his personality wow how would you describe his personality so he's um he's very quiet in the stable but for example, he's a he's a very sensitive horse. Um, like um, he he very much likes and loves to have Felicia around him. Mm -hmm. um, I think that makes a huge difference for him. Mm. Um, there's horses you you feel that more, and there's horses you feel that less. With him, you you feel it quite a lot. Um, they they have a much um, closer and tighter relationship than I have with him, to be honest. Mm. Um, so that also shows again how important everything around the riding is, and not just the riding and the other twenty three hours a day uh, doesn't really matter. It's it's the twenty three hours are very important, and then if nothing goes wrong with the riding, then you did pretty well. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, he's he's very sensitive with those things. Um, 
and then yeah he's just um the the things he's capable to do i think is very unique uh, his his powerful stride uh, the length of length of the stride his scope and uh, also his will to improve and to learn i must say when we first got him all the combinations were super short mm. and for sure they're still short but he got so much better with that he improved so much in in that way to shorten his stride and to to um you know put weight on his hind legs mm. in in all the flat work we do um yeah there there was a huge improvement which which would not be possible if a horse uh, wants to do it as much as he wants to do it um so yeah that's that's actually uh probably the biggest the biggest um improve that he did mm -hmm. he was always able to jump big single fences but to to put it all together um and be be that rideable in the course with with such a big stride um is is i think something very unique uh, which which he was able to 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 do yeah because I, there's a lot written about how big his stride is yeah yeah um and so that's something that you must have to navigate yeah is how do you train a horse to then adjust their stride and be yeah. that have that rideability yeah so what are some specific exercises you d you've done and as part of his training to really work on being able to do the big courses like a knock-in, but then go win Geneva, which is an yeah. indoor yeah. in a small on a small tight space. Yeah. So, uh, okay, Geneva is not a typically small indoor. It's it's yeah. big enough. <laughs> but but still, yeah, he, he did very well in some some tight arenas too. Mm. Um, um, first of all, I think the the flat work is very important, um, and it sounds very simple, but it it's a uh, it's um, something that helped us a lot is to do transitions from canter to trot and from trot to canter. Mm -hmm. um, because in the beginning when I, when I got him, um, I was feeling like I was sitting on top of him, but not really. In Germany, we say you have to sit into the horse. Mm. Um, it sounds a bit stupid, but um, yeah, then the more you're in the horse, then better your connection is. Mm -hmm. And then more you can help the horse with your seat but not only with your hand. Um, so so that was something that we tried to improve probably uh, at first and, and that was the, the hardest part almost, I would guess. Mm. And therefore, very, very simple, but um, trot, canter um, transitions helped us quite a lot. Um, and then, um, yeah, obviously at home, we, we tried to train short lines, mm. combinations, but always, always mixed with also some lines where we can do a lever or some or something. Yeah. Because also on the show, it's not that we uh, can shorten his stride around the whole course. You know, it's it's always giving and taking, and yeah. uh, um, for sure he has more freedom and it's more natural for him, and and he's happier if we if we can do a leave out somewhere. Mm. But it's just not possible to do it all around the course most of the time. And then he, he, he needs to learn after doing a few leave outs here and there in some lines, uh, also middle or end of the course to to get the stride small again and put mm. weight on his hind legs. And that's what we try to do at home and, and create similar situations to not only work about shorting his stride, but also give, his, give him his freedom and to canter up in some lines. But then in between, always um, yeah, make him wait and, and teach him to shorten the stride. Because mm. I saw, I read somewhere that you were talking about a specific strategy of allowing him to sort of adjust a lot mm -hmm. in like yeah. sort of extreme cases in, yeah. in, in the, on the course. Yeah. Is, that, and that, yeah. is that true? This yeah. Is a specific strategy? Yeah. The, the strategy in the course is to leave the pose. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, to to also be inside the time allowed, uh, we had uh, in the beginning some some not issues, uh, but but we had to think about it a lot. Um, we got we got uh, much quicker now. Mm. Normally, the time allowed uh, is fine for us now. Um, but but having all these these things in mind, um, for sure, we we had to use the stride uh, as an advantage. Mm. Um, and do some leaf outs here and there where it is possible. But then the challenge was always to also shorten the stride when necessary. So something unique about Tachi's breeding 
Yeah. Is that he yeah. is, I was reading, I didn't, until I prepared for this, for talking with you, yeah. I didn't really know a lot about the difference between line breeding yeah. and inbreeding. Yeah. So Touchy is unique in that he yeah. has the same, his mother and father, or yeah. his dam and his sire, yeah. have the same grand dam yeah. on both sides. Yeah. So what do you know about like inbreeding versus line breeding it's because it's something that breeders do selectively yeah to concentrate these really unique characteristics yeah and clearly it's worked yeah beautifully in yeah. Tachi's case yeah but what do you know about it there i i i must uh, disappoint you I'm, <laughs> I'm not a breeding expert not at all yeah and um, that that will really be an an question for for United's breeder for yeah. and he's also his owner mm. Julius Peter Zinak mm. who who bred uh, obviously United Touch but also many other um, amazing horses um, his his um, his shot of having a horse for the top sport is is very high mm. like his um, statistics are. Um, pretty impressive yeah so he he clearly clearly knows what he's doing yeah um i i have no idea about uh or no idea but um i would not even um yeah um be confident enough to to talk about those things because julius peter zinak he knows so much more about it and and he put so much thoughts into it mm. which which i probably cannot even follow yeah. So I think it's it's a very complicated, you know, um system or or um very complicated also uh, uh decisions what stallion yes. suits your mare and they know they know their mares for six, seven generations. Uh it's not just that they buy a mare and put a stallion on that they like and, and maybe they're lucky or not. Um yeah, it's it's very very complicated and um and yeah it's it's great that in that case it it worked out uh, so well for sure with united but also with plenty of other horses that julius spread for our listeners first so line breeding is there is similar there is the same um lines mm -hmm. on both sides within four to six generations yeah and then what they say inbreeding and i know it's a it can be a little bit of a of a difficult word because yeah. people when we apply it to humans people go oh my uh, god yeah. but it seems quite strategic yeah um and that's when you see the same line within one or two generations yeah. um and it was interesting reading about what julius said in his decision it was it, he put a lot of thought into it mm -hmm. it was yeah. very strategic and like your like the risks we've talked about in the ones that you've made he also said it was a risk yeah and he sure, was yeah. watching touchy very early on as a young foal to see yeah. okay yeah because what can happen is it can be a concentration of all of the good characteristics yeah. that you want to protect yeah. or it can be an augmentation of all the not so good characteristics exactly yeah and so it's interesting that you know it seems in this case a, a risk a calculated risk was taken just like a calculated yeah. risk was taken in some of your career moves yeah, yeah and in both of your case you know it's worked out really well luckily yes yeah. luckily yeah i think what we'll do is we'll wrap with some of these rapid fire questions which i love mm -hmm. and so just answer the question the first kind of thought that comes to your mind okay so if you could read one book to the horse world what would it be don't read books okay who is the most iconic horse in history? I think there's there's a lot of very iconic horses. Um, in my case, in my career, it's United Touch. Most undervalued skill as a rider? Undervalued skill being um, good in reading horses' minds. Mm. Good answer. Who is the greatest horseman in history? Same thing. There's a plenty of them. Um, for me, um, someone I look very much up to uh, is my uncle, Richard Grome. And uh, from early years on, uh, he was always my, my mentor, my teacher. Mm -hmm. So um, he's someone I look up to a lot. And last question. Mares, stallions, or geldings? Um, a horse with a lot of character, definitely. Um, makes it not always easier, but um, 
but uh, they always fight for you when they're on your side. Um, with uh, United Touch on your side, you go for Stallions. Well, thank you so much for chatting thank with you. me. I learned a lot, and I think our listeners learned a lot. Yeah. And we'll be rooting for you and Touchy. You guys have so many big things coming up. So. We, we hope so. Yeah. Thanks for having me. <laughs>